Popular on the page. It's been around since what, 2001? Yeah, on the page has been around since 2001. Um, it, I have a, a writer studio in Los Angeles where I teach live classes, and I teach them on first draft, rewrite, pitch, TV, um, some story analysis, you know, just whatever I think that a, a writer needs. Uh, in the moment. And also I have a podcast called On the Page. Um, we've been doing it for, I don't know, seven or eight years. Weekly podcasts with writers and producers, anybody who can talk script. And how did you get into doing this? How did I get into doing this? Um, it was kind of a, a sideways move. A friend had asked me to read a script for her, uh, for a company she was working at. I found out you could get paid for doing that. Huh? And I ended up sending my samples um, to Amblin Entertainment at the time, which was um, Steven Spielberg's company. And I got hired as a reader. And I kind of learned on the job um, reading not only for Amblin, but also DreamWorks when they became DreamWorks, and a number of other companies. And then I ended up teaching based on what I was learning from reading scripts as, and seeing how people were responding to them, what was working and what wasn't working, I tried to translate those into tools, and those classes became popular, became a book, stuff like that. Well, we're here at Story Expo 2015, and we're getting you in between classes, and so forgive me if I'm a little rushed here. Oh, I just no wanted problem. to find your uh, take on this. Right now I'm reading uh, Joyce Carol Oates' book, The Faith of a Writer, which is um, sort of about her life, and she talks about uh, the writer's sort of isolation and some of the things that are a little bit darker that some of these books don't always cover. One of the things she says is, the artist is born damned and struggles through his or her life to achieve an ever-elusive redemption by way of their art. Wow. Wow, the writer, I, that, no the art, that the artist is born damned is very interesting to me because I think that some people can feel that they've been damned by creativity, that there is this need to express something and they're sort of in a personal jail until they can get it out. And I think that that might be what she's going for there, is to talk about this fact that it's not that an artist creates because they want to make money, they create because they have to. And, uh, and, and as far as that personal redemption, I think it's more that idea of sort of a, a personal release. But I think she's certainly onto something. Everybody's a little damned and they're better people for it. Interesting, I like that. Should a screenwriter have a plan B? Should a screenwriter have a plan B? <sighs> I guess, look, on a practical level, I guess every artist should have a way that they can make money, but not as the, the that, that plan that says, well, I'm going to give up eventually and then I should do this. I think there, it's fine to have a job that you love that supports the art that you love. And I think what you'll find, too, is that they often go hand in hand. You know, you can bring your writing to a day job and you can bring the experiences from your life and day job and family into your writing. So it, it, these things don't have to compete. What makes a good story? For me, I'm always saying it's action plus emotion uh, because the kind of storytelling that I teach is scripted stor storytelling. So we have to see it and we have to feel it. Action begets emotion which begets more action. So to me, it's the marriage of these two things. Where do you see writers struggling the most? When they come into your classes, what are some of the things they share with you? Where they struggle the most is, I think, probably this need to, to follow rules and get it right. And there are no real rules, and there is no one way to get it right. So I'm always trying to get them just to express their intention for the story and pages as best they can. If they've met that intention, that's right. You know, those are their rules. So I, I think that's, that's, that's where I see artists struggling is, oh, you know, it's, it's got to be perfect. No, it doesn't. It just has to be what you want. Interesting. I like that. What can a screenwriter do to get better at their craft? Is that, is that basically it, to just kind of express that underlying emotion without trying to be so perfect in explaining a certain story that if they were a little more free with it, it would actually? Yeah, I do think that there are, you know, on the other hand, uh, certain uh, tools and techniques that they can use for, for um, paring down 
their work, for focusing their work, for making sure that they're meeting their intentions by picking the words that best express that, by placing the words where they need to, by really focusing their scenes so that their scenes tell a story. Um, so uh, it's not a question of, oh, just be free, okay? It is a question of really looking at your art and making sure that you are telling the story as best you can with those intentions in mind. Um, I'd say don't make it perfect because it doesn't have to be, but you do have to spend some time focusing. Does that make sense? Does it, that does. it does, it does. Is there a point that a writer should give up on a screenplay? Is there a point that a writer should give up on a screenplay? No, I, you know, no. I don't think so, because I think you've all heard those stories of, oh yeah, and then I put it in a drawer, and then six years later somebody wanted this, or a world event happened, and it was just right. So you might put it aside for the moment, because it's not getting the traction you want, it's, 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 or you yourself have tired of it, and you want to move on to something else, go ahead, put it in the drawer, but don't get rid of it. That is a piece of art that will find its way eventually. Do you believe a screenwriter should write their first draft as quickly as possible, just kind of regurgitate it out of themselves and then revise from there? Or ah, you're talking about the vomit draft, aren't you, right? <laughs> it's, 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 it, we have such nice expressions for it. Uh, yes, I do. Um, and I, I urge my students not to look back. That's where the perfection starts to come in and they stop up their writing process and they have these beautiful fir first acts and then they never go any further. So yes, by all means, write to the end. And then you can go back in and you can start honing it and chiseling away at it or fattening it up, make it better, but write to the end. So if they plan to do a 90-page script, mm -hmm. don't, don't stop in the middle and make sure that it's okay. They've got to just get it all out. Right, right. Barrel forward. I think, I think so many people make the mistake of going back and rereading what they wrote the day before, polishing that up, and only moving this much further. We don't have enough time. You know, we only set so much writing time in the day. You've got to make as much use of that as you can. Press forward. Is there a time frame for writing this first script? I think that time frame is, is personal. It really depends on where you fit it in your life. You know, I've made my whole philosophy of teaching is writing in 10 minute increments because of being a busy person myself and knowing that my writers are busy. So I do believe that whatever time you have, you can make the best use of it as long as you focus. Does the screenplay begin with the word fade in? Does it, does it begin with the word fade in? Do you mean like, should you have fade in or not have fade in? <laughs> well, does writing begin with the word fade in or could someone actually begin part of it in the middle? I have an idea for a crux of what I want to happen, but I don't have the book ending. I don't have the, ah. the finished part and I don't have the beginning. Yeah, I think you can jump around, sure. If, if you have certain scenes inside of you that you see visually that are sort of the tent poles for the story, by all means, write those down and then write what works up to it and what springs off of them. But if you get to a certain place where you're only writing what you love, you're being a little undisciplined. You know, at, at that point you have to go, all right, I have to start writing the scenes that I don't know or don't love as well. Then start from the beginning and start moving toward those key scenes that you've already written. Do you think a lot of writers are undisciplined? It seems like writers of any, of all the arts, it seems like writers are the most sort of disciplined, the most hard on themselves, the most sort of reined in. Is yeah. that a fallacy? I, I don't find that they're undisciplined, but I, I do think that we all have little tri tricks that we play where we write only the things that we love, you know, or, or, or that we're good at. You know, I've watched a lot of writers that will write scene after scene, and I'm like, yeah, I know you can do this, okay? Where's that scene that's really hard for you? Write that. So it's not a question of not being disciplined so much as, you know, not wanting to be taken to task for not, not being wonderful right away. Right. For time wasting with writers, aside from surfing the internet and, quote, research, <laughs> yeah. what do you see as some of the stumbling blocks to time management? 
Ah, well, I think you just named two, two of them, you know, surfing the internet and research, right? Research is the most creative form of procrastination where somebody goes, no, wait, I have to stop. I really have to look that up. My, my usual advice is, no, write what you want and then find the research that supports that story point instead of the other way around. Um, but yeah, I think that that is the, the, the place that we all tend to convince ourselves that we're actually working and we're not. We're surfing. Of the screenwriters that you know who have sold screenplays, how much of that work is better than some of those who've just put it in a drawer, they've finished it, they've done 10 drafts, but they're just not willing to like either take what they need to do to go out and pitch it, or no one's really looked at it and said, this is the one. Well, you know, you're, you're hitting on, on both things that sell, sell. One is, you talked about pitching, right? And, and there are some people I've seen who do very well in their careers, not necessarily just sell something so much as get a career off of the script that they wrote. And I've seen, and, and it's one breed of writer that can just make connections with people, you know, convince them first to read the thing, which is hard to do. There's that kind of writer that does very well. But then there's this other kind of writer that does very well because you have to pass the script along. They have written something with such a specific voice and commitment to the characters or an idea or to a tone that it makes everybody want to pass the script along. So it's those two things, either being really good at sort of getting your stuff out there and getting it in front of the right eyes or being exceptional on the page. One of those two things will get you the career that you want. Charisma versus craft, or no, it's not just charisma. The, per the person who has charisma and craft, that's the person, and I've seen a couple of those, and uh, that's a guaranteed success. The, the people who do well can have just one, charisma or craft, but it would be nice if they had, they had all of them. Best questions a screenwriter can ask themselves to develop a better story? right up front is what is the story? What is the movie story? Or what is the TV story? That's where the log line comes in that everybody's so happy to talk about. But it really is a one sentence expression of your intention. If you can't get that down, you might want to go back in and, and, and really re-examine, you know, is there something to write here? So first of all, ask yourself, what is that one sentence expression? Once you have that, then you want to ask yourself, you know, well, what turns you on about that idea? Okay, based on what excites you about that idea, now ask, well, what are the scenes that express that excitement? You know, that really, really show those beats that are that you have to show on screen, you know, and then keep working backwards from there. Okay, who are the people that populate that scene? What do they say? So if you start big picture and then you keep sort of breaking it down to the things that excite you, the people in it, what they say, I think I think those are the questions to ask you as you're writing. How should a screenwriter spend their time? Let's say for 10 hours that they dedicate to their career, how many of those 10 hours should be developing an idea, actually writing the screenplay, watching movies, which again could go into research, <laughs> uh, networking, reading, etc.? I think we've spent our life watching and that we should continue to do so, but that's not really homework. It's just what we do and what we love, and now we don't have to feel guilty about it, you know? Great, Woo. okay, terrific. So you're doing that anyway. Um, as far as networking goes, it is the, the question of keeping your eyes open, shaking hands, making friends, um, capitalizing on relationships. That, that's all. So that can also happen at the same time. This is all sort of multi-platform stuff that you're doing anyway. So when it comes to the real time spent for writing, write. You know, uh, you can't really count any of those things as, well, I was writing because I was watching TV and I was making a friend. You got to write. Is that what Seth Godin calls the work, do the work that scares us? It sounds I like guess that. That, that's, that sounds, sounds right to me. Right. Um, what, what is the work that you see scare most people that come into your classes? That uh, 
Uh, you know, I think it, it, the work that scares people, it depends, but often I see it in sort of the rewrite process where you have spit out that first draft, where you have written the scenes that you love, and then there's this, you know, a problem area that you have to tackle. And it, first of all, figuring out how to fix it, that's, that's hard, but even when you know how to fix it, sometimes it's not what you want to do, and it's, but you have to. That is the place where it's hardest. I think, mm. but once you get passed through, uh, past past that through that, uh, I think that it's probably the most rewarding because you really did the hard work. You know, just focusing back on Joyce Carol Oates' book, *The Faith of a Writer*, she has a chapter on failure. I think she touches briefly that a lot of artists are attracted to failure. Hmm. Do you do you have an opinion on that? I don't know. I'm not really good at you know figuring out the psyche of artists. <laughs> um, when you're in my class, you, you know I'm I'm always like leave the drama on the page. You know I don't want to hear about it. Let's get writing. You know that's sort of how how I work, and I always feel like sort of the the writing pushes through the issues. Um, or you can take those issues and give them to a character. This can be really cathartic for you. Um, but uh, as, as far as people being attracted to failure, maybe one kind of writer is. I don't know if all writers are. I think some people are just attracted to storytelling. When it comes to selling a screenplay, what are some of the mistakes that you see a lot of screenwriters make? Uh, the mistakes would be um, desperation. Um, insistence, you know, where it's, you know, no, you have to read this, uh, mine's the only story, and, you know, the, the more persistent and desperate you are, the more people back off. I mean, think of it, it, if you were dating, you know, no, you have to go out with me and this is why, you know, <laughs> that's charming, right? So, so it's, when I see people do that, immediately, you know, they, they just, they just sort of ruined it. Um, the people that let allow the breathing room in the relationship and let the words make somebody come to them, that's where, you know, deals happen, sales happen. But again, remember this is mainly about getting your career going. This might be where you're hired. You're not always going to sell a screenplay. That screenplay is going to sell you. Well, it sounds like that's where charisma mm -hmm. comes back into play. So how does that work? And I'm sure in LA it's slightly different than in other parts of the country, but how do people develop that charisma where they're not too pushy, but at the same time not too meek? You know, I, I, I may have expressed it wrong with talking about charisma. I was talking about with um, the people who make it. I see like some, some writers are very good about getting their stuff out in the world. That still has to be a good product that they're getting out. And some people are just very good at the page, but they still have to be decent in, enough in a room that they don't scare people off. It really is a mixture of both those things. But the kind of charisma we're talking about doesn't have to be like, you know, big, bold, shiny charisma. We're just talking about sort of um, an authentic connection. I know that authenticity is used a lot, but there's something to that, you know, the idea that you feel like you're talking to a real person who has a story that they want to tell, who, you know, it's, it's there and it, it's the, it, the possibilities of it are exciting and that the writer has made those possibilities evident to the listener, like, this is what I'm trying to get out there. Isn't that interesting? Oh, yeah, it's interesting to me, too. Okay, I'll read it. Right, right. I heard a, a phrase used the other day, a walking hidden agenda. And I think that sometimes that's when we're trying to push our stuff out there. We can come across like that. We don't mean to. It's mm. just that we're very excited about something. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> I know that's a very negative sort of term, but it's actually very, I think a lot of people shy away from it in LA because everybody does have something here they're pitching. Yeah. Maybe it's not a hidden agenda. But how can someone sort of like be excited about it, but not be too aggressive in, if they're working a room. Passion, passion. Passion, okay. Think of, think of instead of like, uh, I have a need, it's I have a passion. Oh, I like you that. You know, and I think that that would, that would work. Excellent. A walking hidden agenda. That sounds like a really good character <laughs> description for like, like a, a, an antagonist. Oh, she's just a walking <laughs> hidden agenda. I love that. Yeah, I know. When I heard it, I just lit up because yeah. I was like, wow. <laughs> Developing a character, we keep hearing about that. There's classes on that. What does this mean and how can someone develop a character? Whether it's someone that's a walking in the agenda or, you know. Yeah, <laughs> well developing a character, I've got a couple of tools that I, I use in class. One of them has to do with um, developing a skill. 
Okay, when you watch a character actually develop a skill, whether it's a physical skill of fighting or whether it's an emotional skill of learning how to connect with somebody, you're watching that character develop. And you're watching it. A, an experience is happening in front of us. A scene is happening. An event is happening. We can see the development. So that's one way to develop a character. What skill, physically or emotionally, are they developing? Another way to develop a character is to think, what are their ongoing patterns or rules that we always see them do? And then do they break that rule? When they break that rule or they shy away from their pattern, they're developing.